much, Andy. That was fantastic. Um, all right. Moving on to our third speaker, we have Benham Taibbi, who is Professor of Energy and Climate Ethics and Scientific Director of the Safety and Security Institute at Delft University of Technology. <clears throat> Taibbi, or Benham, studied uh, material science and engineering as an undergraduate and received his PhD in the philosophy of technology in 2010. He was long affiliated with the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. He's the co-editor-in-chief of Science and Engineering Ethics and co-editor of a volume of The Ethics of Nuclear Energy published in 2015. His research interests are in energy ethics, nuclear ethics, responsible innovation, and engineering ethics. So Benham, I am going to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Alison, uh, for the kind introduction. Thanks to the committee for the invitation and also to Sheila and Andy for setting the scene actually for uh, the third presentation in this panel. Uh, in a sense, I'm building actually on different arguments that uh, but both Sheila and Andy were presenting. I'll come back to those issues throughout the presentation. Uh, the argument I'm defending today uh, in this presentation is uh, a defense of ethics of nuclear energy beyond a yes-no dichotomy. So I want to defend an, a notion of ethics that could help us bring us further than only saying yes or no to nuclear technology. So my field is in ethics of technology. As an ethicist, when you enter uh, a discussion, very often you get the question, should we deploy or should we not deploy nuclear energy, which is a valid question. But in order to answer that question, I think it's more important to focus on a couple of other underlying technological advancements or technological sophistications of the arguments. So instead of having a binary view on ethics, uh, I'm going to defend uh, a, a different take on, on ethics that would neither be a, a wholesale rejection nor a categorical endorsement of nuclear energy. But instead, my argument is that ethics could help us guide throughout the different types of technologies, which will be the beginning of having a more sophisticated look at different types of reactor and comparing them with each other. And that would be the beginning of, and that's the first challenge that Andy actually summed up, a challenge for energy. So we cannot look at nuclear energy in isolation we should look at nuclear energy in the realm of other options, all the options, and compare it. And in order to be able to do that comparison, we need to be able to also compare different types of nuclear fuel cycles, and as a crucial component of that fuel cycle, indeed, nuclear reactors. So what I'm going to, to present today to you is actually a look from uh, the notion of values at different types of nuclear reactors without going to the details of the comparison, but presenting an approach that could help us have a different type of look at the ethical implications of nuclear energy. First of all, ethics could do more than a yes, no answer to nuclear energy. And something that could be helpful is, for instance, to focus on different ethical implications of different existing fuel cycles. You could look at the current open and fuel cycle from the perspective of intergenerational ethics or intergenerational justice, arguing that the open fuel cycle would have different implications for the present and future generations than a closed fuel cycle. Very quick recap of that argument could be that a closed fuel cycle could help us reduce the waste lifetime uh, of the most uh, dangerous types of uh, uh, isotopes, uh, most, uh, more specifically plutonium and, and uranium, so bring down the, close, uh, the, the waste lifetime to a couple of tens of thousand years, which is still a very long time peri period of time, but it comes down from a period up to 200,000 years and a million years. So that would be a substantial reduction of the waste lifetime, which is good from a long-term perspective. But at the same time, it is creating a number of other concerns, both on the safety front because of other nuclear uh, activities involved. Uh, associated with reprocessing and recycling of the waste, as well as other uh, issues associated with, for instance, uh, the military aspect and the dual use issues that, that, uh, uh, that both previous speakers were actually referring to. Those are particularly associated with uh, the, the step up uh, recycling or reprocessing in which plutonium is being separated, uh, but also purification and then enrichment of uranium at the first stage of the uh, uh, fuel cycle in which um, well, enriched uranium has been produced and to a higher degree, it could be also used for military purposes. So this is just one way of looking from the perspective of ethics at different fuel cycles and, and, and identify an intergenerational dilemma in choosing between the existing fuel cycles. What is perhaps equally important or maybe even more important is to try to sort of anticipate what kind of ethical implications are there with the new uh, type of reactors. 
Um, so I I'm going to produce to introduce to you an, a, a take from the notion of values. Um, before getting there, let me say something about uh, why the notion of values are important, have always been important actually in the discussions on nuclear technology. So historically, perhaps not in the very first years of the, the, the first one and generation one and two of nuclear reactors, but as of generation two, and definitely after the Chernobyl accident and Chernobyl uh, disaster, but also Three Mile Island uh, uh, and, uh, in Harrisburg, as well as Fukushima, every time after a nuclear disaster, there is a discussion coming up about how to improve the safety of the reactors. A lot of efforts in, uh, in late 1990s and early this century have been focused on how to make generation two nuclear reactors safer. So that is historically designing, but also improving existing reactors from the perspective of safety. And safety is actually the key value underlying or leading the, the, the design and development of nuclear reactors. Moreover, we have been strongly relying on probabilistic risk assessments in our nuclear policies. A lot of nuclear policies all around the world are identifying actually only the risks associated with in terms of probabilities of an accident to be able to say what type of reactor do a country would a country allow or not allow. Um, so I think risk and safety have been sort of the, the, the notion of safety and the value of safety has been historically the very important the leading value in the development of nuclear reactors. Um, so having a look at sort of this, this history in, in very broad, uh, uh, broad strokes, um, we can see that going from generation two to generation three, three reactors, the, mo the, 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 the light motive there has been uh, uh, definitely was actually to try to improve the, the pressurized water reactors, but also the boiling water reactors in terms of their safety. And by improving those safeties, moving to other models that uh, only uh, slightly change the model in terms of it's not a rigorous, it's not a sort of categorical change, it's more like a, uh, a, a slight change of the existing uh, design into AP1000 and ABWR, which are which have substantially improved the risk of a nuclear accident or a nuclear meltdown. So the first development was uh, to and sort of uh, bits and pieces improve the existing type of reactors to move to better, safer reactors. And that was sort of, again, the value of safety being the leading notion. However, when we look at the generation three plus and generation four reactors, and those are the three reactors that uh, I'm going to very briefly review later on, um, those are the reactors that do not necessarily drive from the value of safety and they do not drive from actually incrementally improving the already existing reactors but they are actually sort of bringing in, in, in many occasions, revolutionary new designs. So that is designing reactors from a perspective of values and not always from the perspective of safety, but sometimes from other types of values. So going back to the argument, as I mentioned, probabilistic risk assessment has been leading in, uh, in our public policy. Um, so the first problem is that probabilistic risk assessment, uh, well, for, for many of these existing or future reactors, we don't even have those probabilistic risk assessments. So for the GFR or the, for the, the, the molten salt reactors, uh, there are no actual estimated core damage frequencies. And the whole notion of core damage frequency doesn't apply anymore, especially in a reactor like the molten salt reactor, in which nuclear fuel has already been molten. It doesn't make sense to talk about core damage. It doesn't make sense to, uh, to talk about nuclear meltdown. So the whole idea of the probabilistic assessment as a sort of a, a way of comparing different types of reactors and guiding nuclear policy would not apply here. A speaker in the following session, uh, John Downer, I'm sure that he will come back to this notion and, 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 and elaborate this, this argument. So that is a reason to say that only focusing on safety, definitely from the perspective of probabilistic risk assessment is not going to be sufficient. What would be more helpful is to also focus on other values uh, uh, in terms of things that are morally relevant to take care of in designing nuclear reactors and things that have been also historically important in, in proposing new types of reactors. So in addition to safety, which refers to unintentional risk or an unintentional harm, any kind of accident, there is the issue of security, which goes with sabotage of any kind of nuclear, uh, nuclear material, but also theft of nuclear material. There is the issue of non-proliferation, the dual use technologies, as I was referring to earlier on, the matter of sustainability, perhaps understood as resource durability, the issue of environmental benevolence, radiation risk that might end up in the environment and some, the impact on the short and the long term in, on the environment, as well as economic viability of different types of reactors. So this is just a tentative, definitely not exhaustive, but a tentative sense, uh, set of values that could help us in better understanding future nuclear technologies and future reactors. So the question is, or the, 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 the argument here is that in designing future reactors, 
we need to actually sort of better understand and assess these values and preferably anticipate them upfront and assess them in terms of how do they actually sort of comply with these values or, com or compromise these values. So in doing so, it is not only that we can optimize all these values. So this is much more than only an optimization practice as we know in engineering. We need to better understand and balance some of these values and sometimes even compromise or give up one of the value in the interest of the other. And that is a matter that needs to happen upfront and early in the development, because otherwise we will run into what Andy was also warning for, uh, a matter of lock, a situation of lock-in, not necessarily lock-in for nuclear as, as opposed to some other type of reactor, but also some type of nuclear that might actually not preferable 30 years in the future, or might not even be preferable halfway through the development. So this is again something that could help us against certain lock-ins in the, in the, and also within a certain type of technology. Um, so the reactors, I'm, and I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to actually to in detail review those reactors, but there are three types of reactors that I have reviewed and refer to molten salt reactors. This is just a very brief schematic uh, overview of the molten salt reactors from, uh, from the NRC, uh, NRC website, uh, but also another type of reactor that has been designed with, again, this one is with safety in mind, it's a revolutionary different design. That's a re the, the, the so-called uh, pebblet reactors or the high temperature uh, reactors. And those are the reactors that have a completely different type of nuclear fuel that, again, cannot physically melt down. It, in the, sort of that's, again, a physical property. The temperature in the reactor will never get to the degree that the, the silicium carbide coating of the of this fuel will melt, which means that a meltdown is physically impossible. So again, this is another take of nuclear safety, another take of ensuring safety, but designing the reactor completely differently. While the molten salt reactor has been partially designed to enable actually using of thorium, which is naturally more abundant than uranium all around the board. Um, and it also has a different global distribution. To wrap up the talk, um, I think we need to understand these values again, because it's, it could help us to avoid lock-in situations in the future. And it could help us at least have a preference in terms of which value should we favor above the other value and which is the value that we want to sort of uh, uh, how would we rank these different uh, reactors with respect to each other? Because, for instance, a molten salt reactor might be most favorable from a durability point of view because of the more abundant thorium, but also the different geographic distribution of thorium. Uh, while, from a safety point of view, a pebble bed reactor might be most favor favorable because of uh, the, the, the physical impossibility of nuclear meltdown, or at least at, that, that is the, the argument as the manufacturers are defending. So this is some kind of more uh, a more complex uh, um, qualitative assessments of different types of reactor could be perhaps in addition to other types of risk assessments, another way of looking at the matter of safety, but in relation to other important values at stake. So what I presented is very much in line with scholarship in ethics of technology that is uh, referred to as design for values or value sensitive design, which uh, uh, focuses on better understanding conceptually, but also empirically, what values are at stake and what value conflicts are happening at an early stage. As I said earlier, I hope that this could help us avoid certain lock-ins um, and certain um, investments that cannot be undone afterwards and political inertia once we have already sort of set in, a, a want, gone in a certain direction for development of a certain type of reactor, but it could also contribute to better and more nuanced comparison of different types of nuclear energy production with other energy uh, types. I think I'm going to stop here and stop sharing my screen. Back to you, Alison. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Benham. That was fantastic.